Hey, welcome everybody to week two of Be Rich. I want to welcome everybody at our Monroe campus, everybody watching online. Uh, this is just a beautiful series, and last week we kind of learned this, that we are the rich people. We, we are the rich people, and you may not feel rich because you compare yourself with people who are richer than you, but if you drove a car here this morning, if you have the ability to, had the ability this week to overeat, right, if you had those abilities, you are in the t upper crust of people all over the world. And so we, we recognize that we are the rich ones. And Paul gave Timothy, in the book of 1 Timothy, he gave a very direct command of what Timothy is supposed to teach those who are rich. He said, command them, talking about rich people, he said, command them to, to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. And we want to make the point that, that what God has given you isn't just for you. It isn't because of necessarily your hard work. It's because God has given you what he wants to give you so that you can be generous, so you can bless other people. In fact, this is what the church should be known for. The church should be known for its generosity and compassion. When people think about LifeBridge, when they think, oh, and if you say, hey, I go to church, people are like, oh, that means you're automatically, you're a generous and compassionate person because we've experienced God's generosity. We've experienced God's grace. And our only goal in this world is to show that same grace, that same compassion, that love. Now, we, we talked about last week, and I want to reiterate it again. We want to invite you to be rich in a very specific area. We want to ask you to be rich in the mission of Christ. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can be generous. But very specifically, we want to invite you to be generous in the very specific vision, mission of why Jesus Christ came to the earth and why we exist. And if you didn't hear last week, I spent the entire message just talking about what it is because sometimes, sometimes we get confused as to what that mission is. And so if you didn't get to hear it, I recommend going into our app uh, checking out online, going to our YouTube page, and watching last week's message. But at the end of the day, this is what we said. Our only mission is to go and make disciples. Now, this is, this is big to me. Um, and it should be big to all of us. Because in, in our current world, I'm excited that this is my mission. What, every morning I get up and I watch news. I watch both liberal news and conservative news. I try to jump back and forth. I try to get a feel for it. Some of you are ingrained in a camp and you just watch liberal news, you just watch conservative news, so you may not know what I'm talking about. But, but if you will go back and forth, do you know what it feels like? It feels like when you go to the zoo and the monkeys are throwing their poop at each other. <laughs> and some of the stuff they're talking about, I know it's really big stuff and it seems like it's the most important stuff in the world, but, but if you go back and forth, you realize that Neither one of them's good. And I'm so happy when I go back and forth, I'm, I'm glad I can go, man, that's not my mission in this life. My calling, my purpose, if, and this is you too, if you're a follower of Christ, and not everybody is, but if you have made that decision, if you're a follower of Christ, your mission in this life is, is to go and make disciples. Right? That is big. I, I got to tell you, that brings me so much joy and so much peace. Because I, I just kind of, and this is going to be a rant, so just buckle up. Um, <laughs> I just get so sick of watching what I see. And here's what I get really sick of, is when Christians get involved and feel like it's really important. Like I get really sick of watching Democrats tear down the president, and I even get sicker when I watch Christian Republicans support him no matter what stupid thing he says. Come on, somebody can say amen to that. Just, you may not 100% agree, but there is no good position, is my point. But at the end of the day, I can sit back and go, but my job isn't that. My job is to go and make disciples and to usher people into eternal life. 
that I can show them what it means to simply have the want to and the desire to follow Christ, to put your faith in Him, and He will forgive your sins, and He will make you new, and He will offer you forgiveness that people in this world and in this society will not offer. It's new, it's different, it's unique. And if you're not a part of that mission, I want to invite you into it today. Even if, even if you haven't even placed your faith in Christ, I invite you to, to join us to go and make disciples. The question I asked last week is just simply, who, who will fund this mission? Bill Gates isn't going to fund it. Democrats aren't going to fund it. Republicans aren't going to fund it. There is no government. There is no agency. There is no organization on planet Earth that is interested in doing this and funding this mission. The only people that would ever do that are people who have experienced God's love, forgiveness, grace, people that have had their sins, no matter how dark, washed away and have had new life inside of them. It's up to us. So that was last week's message in a nutshell, okay? This, this week, where I want to go is I want to go very specifically, not to the broader mission, but very specifically, I want to talk about what, what LifeBridge is doing, what we as an organization are doing to accomplish the Go and Make Disciples uh, mission. Uh, I, want to, I want to give you a brief history of LifeBridge. Um, for so many of you, you might be, have come in here for a year, maybe some of you have been here for a couple of years, um, but a lot of you are not kind of up to speed on our whole journey. And so I just want to invite you, I'm just really quick, I want to talk about kind of our past, our history, and why we have 100% confidence that, that we don't need to limit God and where He's going uh, in the future because He has shown up time and time again. The reason looking back is important. Let me, let me, let me go on another rant. The only, the only time you ever want to look back is when you look back and say, I see what God did. If you look back and say, remember the good old days? The good old days weren't as good as you think they were. If you look back and say, man, remember, the, the, look, looking back is actually a really dumb thing to do. You need to keep your face forward, okay? But if you look back and you remember the great things that God has done, that's the only thing you want to dig up and remember from your past. Amen. The only thing you want to dig up and remember from your past is the good things God has done. And we so easily forget those things. In fact, God warned the Israelites. He led them out of slavery, led them through the Red Sea, and he got them right up to the edge of the promised land. And he said, now I want to warn you, before you go into the promised land, don't forget me. Here's what he said in Deuteronomy 8.10. Before you go into the promised land, he says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Don't give credit to anybody or anything, and especially do not give credit to yourself. Remember, everything that you have is from God. And then he said, be careful. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you to this day. And you, if you've read scripture, you know what happens next? You turn a couple pages, what do they do? They forget. Immediately they forget. And you and I do that too. God does something amazing and we're like, wow, God answered a prayer and that was cool. And then we move on and we're like, what's God done for me lately? That's who we are. So it's important that we remember. So here's a, here's a brief history of LifeBridge. We started in the uh, Flat Rock High School in 2012. It'll actually be this December will be our sixth anniversary. Uh, the, the Sunday before Christmas we started. Our wives have finally forgiven us for doing that. This is the only image that we got of that entire day. Thank you to Bill Rice, uh, who is an elder here. Uh, that's, our, that's our only image. It's blurry, but that was it. Um, most churches, when they start, this is the first thing I gave praise to God for. I had no idea what to expect that day. I thought, man, if we have over 100 people, I'm going to be super excited. Most churches, when they launch, when they get started, it takes them somewhere between two to three to four years to get to that kind of 200 Mark, And it's really hard to kind of get momentum and do things unless you have a collection of, of 200 people working on the same task. Our opening day, we had 265 people. And the next week, because it was New Year's, we had 245. And that's the lowest attendance we've ever had at LifeBridge. And the church just took off. 
from there. Now, our, our objective was not to be a big church. Our objective was just simply, and we didn't even know what this meant. We just wanted to create a place that unchurched people or people far from God, people that haven't been in church, could, could come and, and love, right? So it doesn't matter what their background was. It doesn't matter whether an atheist or a pagan or whatever their background is. We wanted them to be able to come. We wanted them to feel love. We wanted them to feel acceptance. We wanted them to have something engaging for their kids, something engaging for themselves, and ultimately to be able to share the message of Christ in just such a simple practical way and we'd get help people understand it's not about your goodness or your religion or your process it's all about what God's done for you and all he wants is just for you to to want to just put your faith in him so that's where we started uh, within five months we had the opportunity to look at a building most churches don't years they spend mobile we within five months we were looking at a building that we had no business even looking at. Uh, this is our building that's over on Superior Road, Allen and I-75, basically. Great location, huge space. It was already built to be a church. You walk in, and it had a huge wing that was devoted to children's uh, stuff already. Not for a church, but it, it was perfect. Could not be more... I can't articulate to you how perfect it was. We were only a church for five months. And then on the other side... We just had to do some simple renovations, and within four weeks, we were able to move into this building that would have cost us three or four million dollars to build, and we were able to move into it for sixty thousand dollars. Incredible! Yeah, celebrate. Remember, just remembering what God has done. One of the coolest stories, and I'll tell this real quick. This is my favorite story of LifeBridge ever. We were getting ready to move into this building, and it was the grand opening, and we didn't have any money left for marketing. Now, you need to know, churches that plant, start, and have new building launches, most churches spend the neighborhood of sixty to $70,000 in billboards and mailers and advertisements and, and spots on the radio and things online. Sixty dollars or $70,000 is pretty much the norm. We didn't have any money. So we kind of went all in on everything we had, and we said, well, let's just send out one mailer. One mailer. We're going we're gonna to pray over that mailer, and we're going to send it out, and we're going to hope that it does more uh, than, than it should, really. And we were able to send this out. Now, this was a big deal because we didn't have any money. Basically, we took everything we had left, and it was a $14,900 mailer, about a fourth of what we probably should have been spending. But we, we sent that mailer out, and uh, we, we were a little nervous about doing it because we didn't really have the money to do it, but we thought, how can we launch into a building and not tell anybody, right? So we launch into this building. We make the, the decision to do that mailer. Three days later, our youth pastor, our youth worker at the time, he uh, calls me up and he's like, man, some guy just dropped off a bag of cash at the church. And I was like, cool, yeah. He said, I bet there's $6,000 in here. And I was like, whoo. So I got in my car, I'm driving to the church. <laughs> By the time I get there, our executive pastor John's already at the building. And I had counted the money already, and we, need, we had just spent $14,900 on a mailer, and that bag was full of $14,800 in the mailer. And I just could not believe it. It was just an amazing thing. We launched into that building, and we just, for the first time, we just had people who were far from God coming into the church. We spent a few years in that building just kind of doing some fun stuff. Here in these, you got a bunch of pictures here. We might put those on the big screen so you can actually see them. We just did some kind of fun stuff. We messed around with a few billboards. We, uh, we did games on the stage. We just had fun. We just started having fun doing church and rethinking what that could be. Uh, what that could be like. And it was, it was really a day that I wasn't ready for when we did our first baptism service in the new building. Um, we had that same little thing. That's a water tank that we cut the lid off of, right? That thingy over there. Uh, that was in our old building. We had this first baptism service where we got up and we said, hey, you know, you might have signed up, but today if you just feel the call, and I got up and I presented the gospel and I talked about it. It's just about your want to. And if you're ready, we've got shorts, we've got t-shirts. I think we had about 10 people signed up that day. And I was standing in the back of the building. I was like, man, that's incredible. And, and then I saw a couple of impromptu people like, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready to make that decision. And they went forward. And then I saw a couple more and I was like, man, we're going to end up with four 
or five people that weren't even planning on getting up in front of a group of people and getting soaking wet. Like, these are real decisions, right? You don't just do that on a whim. You don't do that because it looks like fun, right? Especially if you're a lady, like you did your hair and you're gonna go in there and look like a chihuahua that just came out of the river. We had so many, me, it's not that big a deal, but the, just had so many people and they kept coming and they kept coming and the band was playing this song and it was about God's amazing grace and I was in the back. Some people are like, oh, you're probably not a very emotional person. I was in the back. <laughs> just watching these people keep them coming and coming and coming and that day 25 people made a decision to publicly go forward with their faith. And it was in this building that we realized that we were out of space. You can kind of see we were out of space. And it was in this building in the foyer that I had so many conversations that my entire church experience I'd never had before. My entire church experience, I'd never talked in a lobby with somebody that was openly a pagan. This lady was like, yeah, I'm a pagan. I don't even know why I'm here today. And I was like, I know why you're here today. <laughs> Because God loves you. That's why you're here today. And as far away from Him as you might be, He wants to have a relationship with you. And we got to be a part of that. And so we had so many conversations and, and with people that just far from God that felt loved, felt accepted, felt like they understood the, the things in the Gospel for the first time and to the point where we were, just, we were just out of space. And so after moving into that building... That we thought we were going, we had these, this option to re up our lease, right, for like uh, nine years because we thought, man, we're going to be there for a while. Uh, by the time our first lease agreement was up, two and a half years in, we realized we've got to go somewhere else. We've got to do something else. Before, before we even had chips in the paint <laughs> that we painted on the walls, it was time to move. So we started looking for a space. We prayed. We asked for God to open a door. And one day we were kind of out of options, and John, our executive pastor, and I were like, well, there's this bowling alley for sale. Let's go look at that. So we drove over there and never been in here before, walked in, were just incredibly amazed. I've got a few, a few pre-renovation slides. So this is on the uh, up street side before we even tore out the, the, right after we tore out the bowling lanes and before we added the, uh, the up street side. This next picture is actually where you're sitting right now. That's what kind of the audit after the lanes came out and where we were at. We walked in here and my, my first thought was, man, it's too big. <laughs> That's right. Maybe we can block off a section for storage or something. But we built, we built this auditorium and last February, February of 2017, we moved into here, had our grand opening, dropped balloons. It was an incredible celebration. And the point I want to make with that is there was, there's so many things that God did, and we talk about numbers a lot, right? We talk about starting with 265 and growing, and then we moved into this facility, and like 1,200 people were coming to the church, and it was just, just, we talk about numbers, we talk about how we've baptized over 300 people in the last six years that have gone public with their faith, and those numbers are kind of cool and really cool to share, but I want you to know, every one of those numbers represents a real person. A real person with their own personal past who is trying to figure out what this relationship with God, they know God exists, but, but what does that look like? And so this morning, because I, I want us to understand, every person in this room, every single person in this room has a story. And maybe you're just beginning kind of this faith journey, and maybe this is your first Sunday, or, or maybe you've been on this road for a while, but every person has a story of God's grace and love. And I want to just give you one example of a story of somebody who we met here in this building and how God used our meager efforts to uh, build a relationship with them. Check out Audrey's story. My name is Audrey, and uh, I grew up in Detroit. And um, it was just me, my mom, and my sister. And um, pretty much grew up a really sensitive, shy girl, and a little different than most of the kids. And you know, throughout school, kind of felt that pretty heavy, you know, with the, the bullying and you know 
was really feeling very different from everybody and it had a big effect on me. I had an idea of well, who Jesus was and what God was, but I never really truly experienced, you know, God's love and, you know, what it really was all about. And, um, you know, I had a lot of rebellion. I started smoking and drinking at 11 and skipping school and not coming home. And that really kept going, you know, getting worse, 12, 13, and, um, you know, I think it was 13 when I took a bunch of sleeping pills at one point. I don't, I'm not really sure why I did, but I did. And um, I was just pretty lost and quite unhappy. Yeah, I was pretty anxious and numb. Uh, I met Aaron when I was 18 and um, I, I just, I don't know, there was something about him. I saw him and I just, I felt like I already knew him. You know, I always say that I felt like I already knew him. Um, so during, you know, our beginning years of our marriage, you know, I would feel anxiety here and there and kind of just push them away or found some way to just dance around it or, you know. At one point I finally decided to quit drinking and then um, I was flooded with, you know, all my thoughts that I was pushing away and yeah, for about three days in a row I was just crying uncontrollably and could not get control of my emotions at all. And um, one night I woke up and I felt like I was dying and I had to go to the hospital. I didn't know what was happening. And um, basically, you know, they just sent me home saying, you know, you're just having a panic attack. But, you know, I, I knew, you know, it just, I couldn't, I couldn't handle my emotions anymore. It was just overtaking me. And uh, after that, for about six years, I had anxiety, you know, for those whole six years. And I felt it was never going to go away. And... I, yeah, I felt completely trapped by it. Um, I just felt very alone, and the only person I could go to was God. And I knew, I kind of knew that God was speaking to me in some way, you know. Um, I just knew I, there was something I was missing, and going to the Bible was really the only answer for me. We were searching for churches and my mother was um, attending Life Bridge at the time and uh, she kept asking us to come and we kept putting it off and um, once she told us that they were opening a new location with a bowling alley in it, um, I uh, let my husband know and he's a big bowling freak and he, uh, you know, he was pretty excited about it so we decided to go check it out. Yeah, I started to feel the power over anxiety when um, I fully started to realize um, that with God I had nothing to fear, you know, um, never really understood that, um, but you know, God tells us uh, to not fear, it's over and over and over in the Bible, and um, I started to just be at peace with you know, whatever God is allowing in my life, just to trust God and He'll take care of everything. I decided at some point that um, I wanted to start talking about my experiences with my faith and, um, you know, the way that God has brought me through everything and um, using my talents to tell my story through my art. I definitely feel that everything that I went through was a gift and when I look back on it, I, um, it's a very precious time to me even though it was really hard and I felt like it was never going to end. Um, I look back at it and I would do it again. Yeah, celebrate that. She said so many things that I think probably resonate uh, with so many people who have a story here. Maybe 
Maybe you're here today and you're like that. There's something difficult in your life. There's some, there's some challenge and you're here and you're trying to figure that out. And that, that's something I personally want to give my life to be a part of, to be on the receiving end and to be welcoming people and being able to show them how, how beautiful and simple God's love is. And that story is just, again, that's not the only story. That is just a typical every Sunday story from the people uh, that come to this church. So I wanted to celebrate what God has done. I want to celebrate the individual lives. I want to just celebrate what God has done um, as a church. And now I want to kind of take a turn, and I want to kind of invite everybody in here to be a part or more of a part uh, of this vision. Um, last year, um, we got up and we shared, man, we, we see God on the move. We get, see God on the move, and we never want to get content. We never want to stand still. We want to never say, oh, God's done enough. Um, so we want to move forward. So last year we got up and we shared a two-year vision. Um, some of you might, might remember this two-year vision if you were here before. Uh, we just had sort of a scattergun approach. There was a lot of things that we wanted to accomplish so that we could have more, more stories like Audrey's, more stories of people uh, coming and understanding God's love for them. And so these are the things that we uh, shared last week. The next slide here. Um, we shared last year, we shared uh, all these different things. We wanted to be more stable. We wanted to, to, to be staffed and be ready and be able to do things like put roof on the building and, and that kind of stuff. So we'd just be in a good position. Uh, we wanted discipleship. We don't want to just reach people in the, the thousands, but we want those people to really have a sincere, uh, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We wanted to focus on youth ministry, probably one of the biggest opportunities that we have. It, no, go back. Uh, we have we have a biggest opportunity we have is so the the one before that so we're gonna go to the one before yeah there we go so we wanted to we wanted one of the biggest opportunities we have is uh, to reach people their youth middle school and high school that's where people are deciding kind of where their faith is going to be in their life we wanted to reach people. Uh, online, we wanted to. People are making a decision about what they believe about God, about big level things with a three minute video. Uh, we want to make an impact in that area. We want to focus on campusing. We want to focus on church planting. And so we said, man, we would love to have 565,000 this next year. And if we do, we think we can accomplish everything on this list. So we came with this simple vision to the church. Some of you were here for that. Some of you weren't here for that. Some of you were here, but you weren't really quite ready to, to like be a part of that. So here's what happened. Uh, we brought in commitments. And over this past year, uh, we brought in an additional 235. So we we're going for 565. We brought in 235. You might be looking at that going, oh, well, that's kind of sad. That's just sort of half. Let me show you what God did with that, okay? This is just what's great. When we come forward with our everything, God takes it from there. Um, so uh, let me show you the fish and loaves. So fish and loaves story, uh, this is just so cool. When the fish and loaves story was happening and Jesus had these small loaves and he was able to take just a few loaves and a few fish and, and hand it out and feed 5,000 people, there were people out in the crowd, they didn't even know a miracle was happening. They were just eating bread, right? They were like, cool, free. You know, they, were eating. they weren't there to watch the miracle. It was only those people that are around watching where it's coming from that are like, this, this is a miracle. And that's what's been happening over this last year. And I just wanted to share that with you because there's a lot of us that are around the basket just watching what God's doing. And we want to share that uh, with you. So three weeks after we share that vision and we have those commitments, I have lunch with the pastor of the Monroe Christian Church. And we meet together, and they say, hey, we think what you're doing is fantastic, and we would really like to dissolve as a church and give you everything that we have down there. And so with three months of us camp casting a vision of what it's like to be a campus and all that kind of stuff, the Monroe Christian Church dissolved as an entity and gave us this piece of property in Monroe that is worth $400,000. So we, we got these commitments in, and then God like made up the difference. Now, here's what we've been able to do uh, with that. Just, just real quick, some, some exciting things that have happened. We've been able to, because of the commitments of the people here and because of the donation of the church in Monroe, we've been able to attack our youth ministry front. We've been able to get in there. We hired a full-time youth minister. We didn't have a youth minister up until that point. And we've been able to do something that most uh, churches I've been at haven't been able to do. We were able to give the youth ministry a budget I know, it's exciting. Uh, and so we've been able to do that, and the youth ministry is positioned and in a place, and it's growing. 
Uh, and so it's really exciting. We were able to help churches uh, get started at the beginning of the year. Uh, Fruitport Church um, out in Fruitport, they, it's called the Lakes Church. Uh, at the beginning of the year, Nathan Zimmerman was planting that church. He came and spoke here actually at LifeBridge. And uh, as it, most typical church plants happen, they were able to plant their church, but the most important things always get left out. And one of the most important things was their sign. They didn't have this. So they're meeting in the Calvary Christian School, but they didn't have a sign. That's like a huge deal when you're starting a new church is you got to let people know where you're at. And so we were able to, because of your contributions, give this new church with little money, uh, just write them a check for $2,800 to put a sign up. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Another church plant we've been able to help is the Unite. Uh, they're actually launching today in Ann Arbor. They're launching today, yeah. This is an image of them getting ready right now, or a few hours ago they were getting ready. They got this cool place. They're launching over there. We were able to give them a check for $7,500. Again, a young church that's getting started. That was a big deal to be able to just hand them that. And so that's what we've been able to accomplish on church planting. Another thing when it comes to church planting is we've been helping out a mission in Guatemala over the past year. They're a church down there uh, reaching people in their community. And we've given them $22,000 over the last year to reach people. In, yeah. Just real quick, I want to share a quick story. In Guatemala, um, they had a volcano erupt that wiped out the village of the people that, that where our mission ministers, and 1,500 people died. The whole village was wiped out. There was 12 foot of lava. Uh, our team went down there this past summer uh, to help support and, and uh, be a part of the mission down there. But they also, because, because we're this kind of church, and we always want to be in a position and be ready to do something, they took down some extra money just in case there was a need that came up. And they were sitting in a meeting one night and they said, there's this one, there's, there's three guys and they've lost their family, they've lost wife, they've lost children. Um, there's these three guys and they really need a, a form of transportation so they can get work because they have to travel a long distance to be able to find any kind of work, but they can't get there. And so the mission got together and bought, was able to get a really good price on motorcycles, um, but there was one motorcycle they couldn't afford to buy, and it was $2,000. And our team leader, Dan Watkins, went down there with an extra $2,000 just in case. And that's exactly how much the motorcycle cost. So he was able to just raise his hand and said, hey, we can give you a motorcycle so that you can find work. And so that's something the church was able to do. Yeah, yeah, celebrate that. It's unbelievable to me that over this past year, I didn't even know where we were going to start another campus. I had no idea what we were going to do, but we just, just within six months of even saying the idea that we wanted to start a campus, we were able to start the Monroe campus, again, with the donation of the church. That's exciting, yeah. And so all of that just to tell you where we're at. A year later into a two-year vision, this is, we've already got one year, so how many years we got left? One, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we could do math. Um, this is kind of what it looks like just really quickly. We are over halfway to completing that mission, that objective. And uh, you can kind of see the breakdown here. There's some areas like discipleship we haven't even, even launched into that is a top priority this year. We want to continue planting and campusing. We want to really do uh, some amazing things. So year two looks like what, this, what we're calling beyond. So last week, we got, last year, we got up and said, man, this is... This is where we want to go in two years. Beyond represents the second year of this campaign. And just really quickly, I want to tell you what we want to accomplish this year. So what we want to accomplish this year is discipleship. We don't want to just reach thousands and then kind of never talk to them again. We want people that attend here for the first time, uh, people that make a decision to get baptized, people that are looking for community, people that are looking to grow in their faith. We want to uh, put di discipleship as the top priority. There's staffing that's involved with that. There's a budget for that that's involved with that. But we, we believe we're going to make a, a huge impact as we focus on discipleship. The second thing we want to do is we want to really give birth to the Monroe campus. Uh, we have started down there. We're sort of building some teams. We're establishing some leadership down there. But we haven't fully given birth to this church. We're only crowning right now. And... Uh, <laughs> a terrible analogy. Anyway, we're <laughs> image that. Uh, you, 
I tried to get our graphics guy to make an image of the Monroe Church coming out of the Taylor campus, but uh, couldn't, he couldn't picture it. He couldn't get the vision. Anyway, um, we're in a place like we've done some really good stuff, but ultimately we realize we need to be fully staffed down there. We need to do uh, something with our facility to just create a better, a bigger life bridge space. And let me tell you, I know you, you may never attend that campus, but uh, let me just share with you, uh, those people matter down there. Whether you ever attend the Monroe campus or not, I want you to know Monroe County has 150,000 people in Monroe County. And of those 150,000 people, 135,000 of them don't go to church anywhere. They don't go to church anywhere. So there is a, you can't think of this as like a Bible Belt community down there. We are a long ways from like being church in the Monroe area. And there's no real churches like ours down there. Uh, we have an opportunity to make a huge splash, and we believe God continues to open the door for that. And then the final thing we're doing is we're preparing for what is next. We want to be in a position, honestly, when Monroe popped up, we weren't really ready. We weren't staffed. We didn't have the funding. We were just like, oh, man, there's a door. we got to walk through it. But holy cow, we almost killed poor Deb Koch, our elementary director, and, and a bunch of other people, right? Almost killed them in the process. We want to get to a place where we are prepared because from what I've seen in the last six years, there is no limit to what I think God might do next. And so we want to be put in a position where we are staffed, where we are ready, where we are funded, and when an opportunity comes up, we're ready to roll. So we're looking at the next year, a big audacious goal. Our objective is 550000 in addition to what we're bringing in this year. Now, uh, this, this past uh, couple weeks, we've been working with a lot of our leaders, kind of the, the people that lead and, and are all in at the church and are connected here at the church, and we talked with them, and they said, hey, we want you to set the pace. We want you guys to go first. And so we handed out commitment cards to them, and we said, hey, we want you to fill out this commitment card and turn it in before we even go to the congregation and tell us what you're capable of doing. And so we already have commitments in from about 30 families in the church who have been invested and are invested in the church, and they agreed to give an additional $70,000 over this next year. So the, the ball is already rolling. I got to tell you, as a, as a, as a pastor uh, with other leaders, we are already in this thing. And when I first got the commitment card in my hand, I was like, oh, man, again? Haven't I, haven't I, what, do, what am I going to, you know, am I going to increase again? And Bethany and I prayed about it. And it was like, yeah, yeah, you are the rich and you are the, you are the person, God talking to me, you are that person who has the ability to do more. And so we, as we prayed about it, we're able to write down a number that we initially didn't even think we would be capable of. And so we come to you today and here's what we want to do. This is just the practical step. You're going to get a commitment card when you walk out of here today, uh, just one for each family. You can take that. You don't need to do anything with that right now. We just want you to take it home. We want you to pray about it. We want you to think about it. We want you to see yourself here. We want you to think. Can you put that on the big screen? That's a little hard to see. If you're at this point in your life, if you have not made a decision to be a giver or make a decision to give to the mission of Christ, just start with 1%. It, it can be easy. Just, just start with 1%. 1%. I did some math. You might have to correct me on my math, but if you uh, make the median income in Taylor, which is $40,000, and that's kind of where you are, and you take 1% of that, and you divide it over 12 months, it's basically $34. And you might just see, and maybe that's a huge faith, step of faith. That might be $34. I don't have $34. I want to challenge you and encourage you to make that step. Maybe if you look at your finances, you're already giving in that kind of 2 to 9%. Maybe you're, maybe you're in a place where you're kind of, maybe you're given a certain amount. We just want to ask you. We're not asking you to do anything crazy. just want to maybe take that next step. Maybe you're given 2 to 9% already, and it's time to kind of make that step and say, you know what, I can give, I can give 10%. We want you to look at your money. We want you to look at your finances like you would any other bill, and we want you to think percentage. What could I do on a monthly basis for the contribution of the church. We want you to take those cards as you're leaving today, and then on October 14th, 
after you've prayed about it, thought about it, you know, decided whether you're in or connected or not, we want you to bring those back. We're going to have a celebration on October 14th. You're going to make those commitments. I won't even know what your commitment is. Okay, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get a big stack and line them up from one to five hundred and be like, okay, you're my favorite, and that's, that I won't even know what they are. This is genuinely a commitment between you and God. This is you saying, I believe, I believe that it is my calling to go and make disciples, and I want to contribute to a church that is solely focused on going and making disciples. Let me pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for every person gathered here today. Thank you for the people's lives that you've changed in the room. Thank you for letting us be a part of it. God, I pray that you would you would move in the hearts uh, of people. You would open doors and possibilities that uh, maybe we don't even realize are there to be able to accomplish your work and your will in this church over the next year. God, thank you for surprising us. I pray that you'd continue to surprise us and pour out your grace and your mercy on us as we do your work. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen.